My name is Sylvester Anthony, and I represented the second respondent, that is the supervisor of elections, and was led by senior counsel Anthony Astafan. Let me first of all start off by complimenting the, minister, the Honorable Minister on his success as per the judgment delivered yesterday. I wore another hat in a previous time, that is in the, the 2004 election, when I represented Mr. The Hon who was then Honorable Rupert Herbert in an election petition brought again by Mr. Grant. There's a saying that three time, three strikes and you are out. This is Mr. Grant's fourth strike because he ran an election against Honorable Rupert Herbert, he lost. He filed a petition, and he lost. He ran an election against Minister Philip, he lost. And as we know, as of yesterday, he filed another petition, and he lost again. But what is significant about those two petitions is that whereas in the first petition filed in which I represented Mr. Herbert, and in this petition in which I had the privilege of representing the supervisor of elections. In the first petition, 95% of the allegations were struck and the remaining 5% went to trial and there they were dismissed. In this petition, at the preliminary stage, every single allegation was struck out. There was nothing in the petition that could even survive to go to a trial. And that is what makes Mr. Grant's statement yesterday to the press, that somehow this judgment was a mere technicality, so outrageous, and to say the least, disingenuous. The suggestion by Mr. Grant, himself a lawyer of some vintage, that a judge of our court would spend 48 pages and some 100 and 54 paragraphs to dismiss a petition on a met technicality, as I said, is outrageous and disingenuous. Let me now speak to the issues that were raised against the supervisor of elections, because there will not be another opportunity for me to do so, and so I want to, take, to, do, to do it now. This petition filed by Mr. Grant made some, what I can only describe as wicked allegations against the supervisor of elections. He repeated some of the very allegations he made, and I want to point out, for those of you members of the press who will read the judgment, as I hope you will, that whereas in the judgment delivered by Mr. Justice Bell in 2004, he made some comments and some recommendations for improvements in our electoral process. When you read this judgment by the Madam Justice Harry Prasad Charles, you will see no such comments about the electoral process. In fact, I draw your attention to, to head note number six in the judgment. And I'll speak about it a little later where Mr. Grant had alleged certain irregularities with regard to hearing of objections, which resulted in names appearing on the list in constituency number four that ought not to have been there. This is what the Honorable Judge said. I'm reading from page three of the judgment. Paragraph six. There is a comprehensive statutory regime to address these matters which should have been challenged before the election. That was the judge's conclusion in relation to Mr. Grant's allegations that there were, he had objections that were not heard. And the judge pointed out in the judgment that he, Mr. Grant himself, in his petition, avert to the fact that Mr. Hamilton, Eugene Hamilton, 
had taken advantage of this comprehensive regime to challenge names on his list, which names were subsequently removed. That was what the judge concluded. So Mr. Grant didn't do his work. He didn't do the work that he had to do before the election. And rather than accept defeat, he alleges that somehow the supervisor of the elections was part of what he calls an, uh, a general policy, a general policy to, in local parlance, to cheat him from, from, from victory. So I want to start by, by his first allegation. His allegation was that the supervisor of elections carried out a policy of illegal voter registration. I said, this is, a wicked, this is a wicked allegation. That's the only word I can find to, to describe it. Carried out a policy of illegal voter registration, which encouraged persons to register, and on election day, allowed them to vote in constituency number four, in which they did not reside. This judgment, which Mr. Grant describes as a, as a technical judgment. Well, you know, the judge dealt with his allegations. And I'll point you, members of the press, to page 30 of the judgment from paragraph 90. And it goes on for a number of pages, for a number of pages. But for, in summary, the judge speaks to those in head note in head note, numbers 4, 5, and 6. Mr. Grant's petition, my friends, was, and you, I, I want to take some time to do that because I want the public to understand what went on here, was 25 pages long, comprising some 28 or so paragraphs. The judgment dealt with every single paragraph, every single allegation, and every submission made by his lawyers. So much for a technical issue. And this is what the judge said in head note number four. Remember I told you he had some 29 paragraphs, I think it was. 29 paragraphs in his petition. The judge ruled in head note number four, paragraphs one to 23 are not paragraphs jointly or severally which could result in the avoidance of an election. Need I say more? The judge, after hearing the arguments, reading it, decided that 23 paragraphs, 1 to 23, either separately or when put together, could not result in avoiding an election. Just to contrast for you, that was a total of, uh, I think, 14 pages of his petition. Okay? In, in head note number five, the judge concluded, an illegal practice must refer to a practice defined as such in the Elections Act. The judge concluded, because that had to do with an allegation Mr. Grant made, that the supervisor of elections, by not giving him, his agents, the list, the, 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 the list that had with it the ID photographs, by failing to give him those documents on election day, somehow that resulted in him losing the election. 